right, welcome everyone to track two. We have an action packed session in front of us. So first off, we have Laura Durkin, uh, sorry, Duncan, who will be talking about test, what to, what to look out for before genetic testing in HD. Go ahead, Laura, you wanna share your slides? So thank you for the introduction. There are my slides coming through, okay? Yeah, so look perfect. Great. So as Mustafa mentioned, my name is Laura Duncan. I work as a genetic counselor in Nashville in the United States. Um, and I work for the past four years with the Center of Excellence here for Huntington's. So I've worked with many individuals who are considering or who are going through the genet genetic testing process. I was asked today to talk on what to know before going through the genetic testing process, some considerations to make, and just kind of a, a heads up about what that process might look like. And now I'm speaking from my own perspective as a genetic counselor. I am not personally impacted by HD, but I have worked with many individuals who are, and it's been a privilege working with that patient population. And I've learned a ton, and that's kind of what I'm going to be presenting today. So I'd like to start off by just doing a quick genetics 101. So we're on the same page with some of the terms that I might be using when we talk about genetic testing. So as many as you know, Huntington's is an autosomal dominant condition that is caused by a repeat expansion or when the same letters of DNA are repeated over and over and over again in the gene called HTT. Now we typically have two copies of this gene, one that passes down from each of our biological parents or one that passes down from the sperm and from the egg that go on to create us as an embryo. And since that sperm or egg only pass on one of the two copies, when an individual who has Huntington's, who has that repeat expansion goes to pass on the gene, there's a 50-50 chance that they pass on the gene with the expansion, which means that there's a 50-50 chance that a biological child of an affected parent with Huntington's even if they don't have symptoms, if they just have the repeat expansion, would also receive that repeat expansion and then be at risk for HD. It is not dependent on your sex or on your gender. So both individuals assigned male and assigned female at birth have that 50-50 chance and it resets it itself with every single pregnancy. So just because you might have a repeat expansion doesn't mean the second individual born in your family would not or vice versa. And it's important to know the number of uh, repeats in the gene can kind of change the risk of having symptoms of HD. So when someone says that they tested negative, that implies that their results show that both copies of their HD gene were 26 or less for their repeat number. They are not at risk to have symptoms of HD, and this is stable, which means that it's not going to get larger for future generations. So biological children of that individual would not have an increased chance. 27 to 35 and 36 to 39 are unstable ranges, meaning they could get larger as they go from generation to generation. And depending on the number that someone falls into, they may or may not develop symptoms of HD within a typical lifespan. Those 27 to 35 tend to be without symptoms, we call this an intermediate range, while those 36 to 39 may have symptoms, but typically a little later onset compared to the other individuals who have 40 or more. If someone has 40 or more repeats, that's what we consider a positive result. They will develop Huntington's symptoms within a typical lifespan, and it is unstable, meaning it could expand, stay the same, sometimes get a little smaller as it goes to each generation, but future generations would have an increased chance to have Huntington's. And there is no way to predict who is going to have the HD expansion within a family. Just because you look like your parent who is impacted, just because you look the opposite of your parent that's impacted, or you both have red hair, or you both have dark skin, that does not give us any information about your personal risk to have HD. Um, so there's no external factor that we can um, look at to help determine this. So when it comes to the genetic testing journey for HD, it's important to know that everybody's journey is different. There is no right, there is no wrong, there is no what is the typical journey or what's the typical story. So some of the things that I mentioned today may not apply to you or maybe things that you thought through um, in a different way than how I'm presenting it. And it's important to know that testing can occur at various points in somebody's life. 
someone might choose to have testing when they have symptom onset. So they start to notice chorea, or they start to notice changes in their mood or their behavior, or their loved ones mention that they've noticed these features. And that is a trigger for genetic testing. While other people choose to get tested while they are at risk, meaning there's no obvious signs or symptoms to show that they're at risk for HD, but they know based off their family history that they can have a 50-50 chance. Or sometimes, even if it's the generation above or an aunt or an uncle, that chance can be even lower, closer to 25%. Some individuals choose to undergo genetic testing while they are family planning, and they use testing at the embryo stage or once they are already pregnant, while others choose to never get tested. And there's no right or wrong answer for any individual person, but today I'm gonna to really focus on that before symptoms testing, that kind of at risk or what's sometimes called predictive testing, because that's the one that might have the most considerations um, for young adults who are considering this testing process. So first, where do we start? And I think this is gonna be a, an internal process for the most part of trying to figure out when is the right time or is it the right time for genetic testing for Huntington's? And there's some big picture questions that can be really helpful to ask yourself prior to going for with genetic testing or as you're kind of working through the process because you don't have to decide ahead of time that you want testing to come talk about it, right? I am happy to talk to people who are unsure if they wanna pursue genetic testing to help them walk through these questions. And I am sure no matter where you're located, either a you know, primary care provider, if you have a neurology provider, or if you have access to a genetic counselor, would be happy to walk you through this process as well. And HDO as well as other HD support organizations have safe platforms to talk through these things too. But some good questions to start with could be, what are my motivations for testing? Why now? What about this point in my life has made me feel like it's the right time for genetic testing? And what else is happening in my life right now? Am I going through several large transitions? And is now the right time to add one more piece to that puzzle or one more piece of information to that plate that might be a very heavy plate to be carrying right now? Or are we trying to make big decisions and having this piece of information could really help facilitate that decision-making, having all of the kind of knowns, even though as we'll talk about once we have HD testing, there aren't always clear-cut answers. What support do you have in place and what support could you benefit for from prior to genetic testing? This is a heavy process. There's a lot of emotions involved. There's a lot of relationship dynamics that might change. There's a lot of self-reflection that might need to occur. And who do you have to go to, to talk to, to support you through that process? And it might be helpful to start to identify that support network and help add to that support network prior to testing. So you have that really strong support foundation prior to even getting any test results. And then what would I do with different test results? This is a question that I ask all of my patients when they come see me in genetic counseling, but what would it mean to be positive versus negative first fall in that uncertain or indeterminate range? And how would that influence the decisions that you're making going forward? As I mentioned, this process can have a huge impact on your relationship with yourself. It might require a lot of self-reflection. It might require you to look into parts of yourself or parts of your childhood or parts of your adulthood that you have not wanted to face for a very long time. It can open up old wounds, can also open up new doors and new possibilities. So walking through what this might mean for you as a person is going to be very important as you work through this process. I do wanna point out a few trends that I've noticed in working with my patients. Um, one is kind of our expectations versus reality. Many of the people that I work with, if I say, what do you feel your test results are? Do you have like that inner feeling of whether you're gene positive, gene negative, have the repeat expansion or do not? And many people have that kind of gut feeling and the reality, once you get those test results, if they're different than what the expectation was, can be very hard hitting. Whether it be thinking you're positive and coming out negative or thinking you're negative and coming out positive. In addition, just because you expect it or feel it, seeing it on a piece of paper confirming that expectation is very different than feeling. It kind of makes it more real for some of the patients that I work with. In addition, 
many people say they want to know to relieve this uncertainty that they've been feeling. You know, am I positive? Am I negative? How am I making life choices giving this information? And it might feel powerful to have the gene result to know yes or no, am I at risk for HD? Sometimes though we have those uncertain results where we're still in the gray zone going forward. And even for people who test positive, meaning they have that repeat expansion, we don't know the future for that individual. It does not necessarily mean that I can tell them when they will have symptoms, what those symptoms will be, or what the progression is of those symptoms. Because this condition changes and it's varying from person to person, even in the same family with the same repeat number. So just because your parent followed one course in terms of their HD journey does not mean their child who is also gene positive will follow that same course. And then the assessment of readiness. You know, that's easier said than done. Am I ready? Well, what does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be ready for you? But this is a good question to ask yourself going through this process because it might impact that relationship with yourself. And as I mentioned, the impact of various types of test results. Negative, what will that look like? What will your future look like? Positive, what would that look like? What would that future look like? What would that impact? And I'm certain. Um, and you know, for many people, they're like, well, yeah, Laura, if I'm negative, that's gonna be such a relief. But it's important to remember that all of these types of test results have an impact on you and might lead to feelings such as guilt. Survivor's guilt is a very, very powerful feeling. Like, why not me? Well, why me to be the person in my family who didn't get this gene? As well as sometimes opening up doors that we didn't know existed. We might have shut out opportunities because of our uncertain status and having results can sometimes open up a whole lot of opportunities that we didn't think we had, which can be really overwhelming for some individuals. So really processing the impact of this on you as a person and your own identity can be a really useful tool prior to genetic testing. In addition, this can affect more than just you. It can affect your family dynamics, your relationships with your family members who are at risk and those who aren't. It can sometimes impact your romantic relationships. Do you currently have a partner? What are their thoughts about your genetic testing journey? Are they supportive? What would happen if you were gene positive or gene negative? Or are you searching for a romantic partner? And would this change the way that you date or not date going forward? Friendships can sometimes be impacted by HD results. Do we have that network of support, as I mentioned? As well as things like family planning. Am I going to have biological children? Or if I already have biological children, how will this result change my relationship with those children? as well as experiences that people might choose or choose not to pursue based off of their genetic test results. Would results impact your choice for education going forward, your choice for a career going forward? Would it impact your travel plans? You know, I'm gonna, when my patients told me being at risk helped them live big and love big, but would knowing your gene status change that? Um, would it change your financial plans? Do we need to set money aside to help or care for you if you're no longer able to bring in income because of HD symptoms? Or would you be able to open up opportunities financially based off of results? And then in the United States, we have a lot of, well, we have some, not a lot as a big word here, but we have some protections against discrimination. We have laws that prevent your health insurer and your employer from using your HD status to drop you or fire you or not cover you. But those same protections may not exist where you're located. Is this going to be a confidential process? In the United States, we have laws that prevent us from sharing healthcare information outside of the kind of face-to-face -face interaction we have with the patient. You got to make sure that you have those protections or understand what protections you do and don't have so you kind of know what the risks are going forward with results. So let's say after kind of thinking through all this, you decide, yes, I want to talk to somebody about testing or I think I'm ready for testing, I'm ready to take the next step. So what does that testing process look like? Well, the HDSA has pr produced some guidelines or a protocol for testing, for predictive testing for Huntington's. And they recommend having a support person throughout the process. As you can see here, they recommend several steps for genetic testing. So this isn't a go to the doctor, get your blood drawn, and then you know your results two hours later. 
Sometimes this can be a very long process, which we'll talk about in a second. But having multiple visits, having follow-up planned, and as I mentioned, you don't have to know if you want genetic testing to start this process. But if you do decide to start the process, here are some things that might occur next. You might meet with a care team that has multiple people on it. So here at Vanderbilt, we actually have a genetic counselor, a neurologist, and a social worker work with my, our patients at the same time. You might meet with various mental health specialists, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, or depending on where you're located and what resources are available, this might occur through your primary care provider. But kind of knowing what the process is, reaching out to others in your community, if that's an option, can be really helpful to prepare you for the actual logistics of testing. Typically, at a first visit, there'll be a lot of questions asked. So be prepared to share, which can be hard when you're talking to somebody that you've never met before and you might not have rapport with rapport being a, a relationship with or a comfort with. Um, and so it's helpful to know ahead of time that they're gonna ask some very personal questions about you, about your motivations, about your health history, including your mental health history. We do assess for suicidal risk factors such as thoughts about suicide or suicide attempts. We do assess for mental health diagnoses and support for those mental health diagnoses. And we assess for other factors that might influence a response to results. We ask a lot of information about the family history, which, as I mentioned, could open up, you know, um, memories of things that we had put aside for a while. Sometimes a physical exam will occur. There'll be a genetics 101, especially if you meet with a genetic counselor. And then hopefully whoever you meet with will help you with this informed decision making, meaning are we making the decision that feels best for you in this moment with the information that we have. And they'll have conversations with you similar to some of the points that I just brought up of what you should consider ahead of going into the testing process. We also know when it comes to making a decision, there's no, as I mentioned, right or wrong answer here. So you might decide yes. Now is the time for genetic testing. I would like to pursue the next step. Or after you have that initial meeting or after even you get your blood drawn, you can say, no, thank you. I have changed my mind. This is not information I want. Or maybe later is a better time. After talking to my team, I learned that, you know, I do have a lot of factors that are at play right now. And maybe adding my HD status isn't something that's going to help me going forward in this moment. I'm gonna consider this a couple years down the road or a couple months down the road. Um, and so you can go back and forth between these answers. And it's not like what you decide is set in stone, except for after you come and get those test results, because at that moment, we can't take back the information that we've given you. But it's important to know that you can have um, conflicting ideas about what's best now over the course of this process and just having that open communication with whoever is helping you with genetic testing is gonna be very important. So let's decide that yes, now is the right time for testing. What would happen next if that was the case? Well, there are several things that would be important to ask about or to think about at the um, beginning as you go into this process. One, what does this look like for me financially? How do I pay for the genetic testing? How do I pay for my consultation with all these specialists I might be seeing? Or if I'm in a community where there aren't HD specialists, how am I paying for the visit with the primary provider who's doing the testing? Are there grant options to help me pay? Will it run through an insurance if I have a health insurance? Will I be paying on my own out of pocket? And what would that cost look like? In addition, most of the time, HD testing is going to be a blood draw that occurs. So that might occur after you decide you want genetic testing. But prior to this, it's going to be super important to talk to your team about how results will be received. So the HDSA recommends results in person with a support person with you. And I highly recommend in-person results or at least face-to-face -face telehealth. At a minimum, I would recommend that you advocate for yourself and say, I need to know a set time and date where results will be available. So you are not getting a phone call out of the blue with your HD test results in the middle of your workday or in the middle of you know, caring for your children with nobody else supporting you 
or in the middle of you know an outing with some of your friends out and about on the town so that you know kind of what that time frame will look like, which can have a lot of anticipation leading up to it, which I'll touch on in a second, but at least make sure that you would be in a safe space with the support that you need for results. And then knowing what that time frame will look like. As I mentioned, this is not a get the test no results a couple hours later process. In the United States, it typically takes at least two to three weeks for the results to even be reported out. In other countries, this may take even longer. So what does that process look like? What will the results disclosure plan be? How do you contact your team in that waiting period that will occur if you need support from them or if you need them to help you find other supports more locally? And then another really big concept that we um, have here at Vanderbilt is something called anonymous testing, which is can I test outside of my medical chart or outside of my own personal name? And if so, what does that process look like? What are the benefits of, me, of this for me based off of the protections that I have in my country? And how do I go about doing this? So in the US, you know, I can create a chart and say, you know, today your name is Susie Smith and Susie Smith's results will be your results, but we'll be able to link them back to you in the back end if you ever need to. Um, some countries, at least in the United States, now have a lot more transparency with medical records. So technically, some test results can come to the patient before they go to the provider if they have access to their medical record electronically. So this is important to know if the healthcare system that you're working in has shareable data, are you gonna accidentally see your HD results before your provider? So ask these types of questions prior to the genetic testing. If we pursue genetic testing and we have this waiting period, how long will it be? Who will you go to during this period? It'll be helpful to have that support network, as I mentioned, built for this time. And remember that there's going to be a range of emotions and there's no right or wrong way to feel while you go through this process. There will be ups and downs and moments where you forget that you have pending results and moments where all you can think about are your pending results. And that will vary during these several weeks. So who will you go to for support? What self-coping do you have put into place for when you are feeling these ways? And then on results day, it's important to have that support community available, whether in person with you, which is what I highly recommend. I also recommend that support person being someone who's not directly genetically at risk because of your results. If, possible. if your only support person is someone whose results risk will now be changed because of your positive or negative results, then bring them because we want you to feel supported. But if we can avoid that, that can actually be beneficial because it's like giving two results at the same time if another person directly impacted by your results genetically is also present. Um, and I think some people might not think through that ahead of time. I know I definitely did it the first time that I had a patient bring their children. So when they had positive results, now their children who are at risk know that they're at risk for, for sure at this moment. Um, and I think it was a really impactful time for everybody, but we want to make sure you're supported. So think through kind of what that support community will look like for you at the results day. If your support people are not physically with you or only a handful of them are physically with you, how will you tell them afterwards? So for some of our families, they set up a phone call to say, I will call you in three days. This is when I'm going to call you about my test results or potentially a family meeting but giving yourself space to process what these results mean for you can be very important um, prior to telling other support people. And these are like your results to sit with for as long as you want. Also thinking through what will happen when I go home, who will be there? Who will be around me? Do I have off work for the day? Do I have to care for others that day? Who am I gonna talk to and get through those initial moments after results come back? What are my plans and what, what will surround me in those moments? And then also thinking through that long-term support, no matter if you're gene positive, negative, or those inconclusive results, support is going to be um, very helpful, I think, as you move through the journey of processing the results and what they mean for you. So I know that was a very quick overview and 
a lot of information very fast. I'd be happy to answer questions if we have time. That was a fantastic presentation and a really nice overview. Um, as we wait for some questions to stream in, I have a question. Um, what happens when access to genetic counseling is limited? For example, in countries where there's no set, you know, good setup, there's no really HD center of excellence. What can people do essentially? Yeah, so I would recommend people where there is no HD Center of Excellence or genetic counseling is limited, reach out to their HD support organizations like HDO that they're connected with um, because there are resources on the web that can walk through some of these concepts and questions. There are support groups that work with you know, young individuals who are at risk for HD where other people who have been in your shoes can walk through what their thought process is to help you start that reflection and start to decide if now is the right time for genetic testing. Um, I wish there were access to genetics everywhere. And I think reaching out to the support organizations to see what options are available for you can be very helpful. I know there are some um, companies that are trying to start telesupport, um, and I'm hoping eventually that could be global telesupport where you can have like a video interaction like this with a genetic counselor in somewhere completely different than where you live. Um, but I think, unfortunately for many individuals who are at risk for HD or are impacted by HD in a community where there is no genetic counselor, you have to rely on asking yourself a lot of these questions, thinking through your motivations and then advocating for yourself when you do meet with the healthcare provider who will be coordinating the testing for you. All right, let me check if there's questions. Uh, none. Okay, mm -hmm. just someone thanking you for the presentation. And I think we have someone from England as well, thanking you again that this was this has been really helpful. Yeah, thank All you. right, thank thanks, you. Laura. Yeah, really nice presentation.